We dedicate this episode of Did You Hear to 6x6, ready to read. It's our early literacy program. Discover the six skills all kids should develop by age six. In today's episode, Beth Atwater sits down with Melissa Horakhern and Greg Windsor in our We Recommend section to discuss romance novels. But first, it's What's Happening. Helen Hokanson, Amanda Wallmeyer, and Dave Carson talk about food insecurity. So for every episode of Did You Hear, we like to have a couple different segments. Uh, Later, we'll talk about what we recommend, but we also like to tell you what's happening. And one of the things that we uh, have happening at the library now is a discussion about food insecurity. And so today, uh, I have with me a couple very special librarians that are going to talk about food insecurity and some of the programs that uh, we're having here at the library. Let's start off with introductions. Uh, To my right is... Helen Hokanson. Thanks for listening. And what do you do here at the library? I am a reference librarian. Uh, I mostly focus on our writing programs, um, but in this past programming uh, series, I got caught up in talking about food insecurity. Awesome. And we will do that in just a second. First, Amanda... Please introduce yourself. I'm Amanda Wallmeyer. I'm the local history librarian here. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us and our podcast audience who is dying to hear about food insecurity. So what programs do we have, Helen? So we're wrapping up our screenings of the film Wasted, the story of food waste. And and for me, this was probably my introduction to um, programming around food insecurity. I watched this documentary and I wanted to share it with people. And luckily, I have a job where sometimes I get to share things of personal interest. Oh, that's and excellent. yeah, so most people are not aware that because Johnson County is generally affluent, there is still a lot of food insecurity in this county. For so sure. we there's about an estimated um, 1.6 million pounds of food wasted annually just in Johnson County, um, and that's valued at about seven million dollars. 1.6 um, million pa- mm-hmm, per year. Mm-hmm. Wow. And then when you consider that 11.6% of Johnson County households experience some kind of food insecurity, you can see how those two things are are very related. So uh, let's just quickly define what food insecurity is. That that means that you you are not sure where your next meal is coming from. Yes. It is defined as households who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Wow. Mm-hmm. And that could be, you know, either geographically, you might live in a food desert. It could be economics. It could be that you're just busy. It, you just don't know where your next meal is coming from. Wow. Um, and then the second screening that we're going to be um, showing at the library is A Place at the Table. And this documentary is remarkable in that it puts a human face on food insecurity. Um you know, it, it really focuses on those people who are, are in that spot between they make too much money to qualify for um, benefits, um, food stamps, that kind of thing. But they don't make enough money once they pay the rent and keep the lights on wow. and, and that kind of thing. Wow. So when we have these screenings, are they here at the Central Resource Library? Um, the two uh, screenings of Wasted that we've shown were at Central. Our last one will be Thursday, coming up this week, at our Monticello branch. And then a place at the table will be both at Monticello and Central. Okay. Um, well, this podcast will come after this Thursday. Oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> That's but, all right. you know, you can check both of these films out for free from your favorite public library. Is that right? We have it here in the collection? We do. Excellent. Mm-hmm. They might be checked out right now, but you can get on the list, same as any, as any item that we own. So those two titles again are? Wasted, the story of food waste, and a place at the table. Okay, great. That is fantastic. Uh, so what else do we have uh, as far as programming that involves food insecurity? 
We have a lot. We have invited uh, Loretta Craig, no, Loretta Garrett Craig from Prairie Garden Farms in Baser, Kansas. She does a really nice program on modern day victory gardens. So she talks about the history, but also the continued importance of, of backyard, front yard gardens um, in our communities and how that relates to food insecurity. That's awesome. So when um, we on the web team were uh, working to find some imagery to um, supplement uh, our description of, of this event, you know, there's some really great um, um, graphics and, mm-hmm. and photography about mm-hmm. um, these Victory Gardens. So tell us, do you, do you know the origin of the Victory Garden? Oh, oh. oh, Amanda. <laughs> so uh, the Victory Gardens were implemented in uh, World War II when they were implementing rationing and things like that. Sure. And encouraging people to grow food on their own rather than rely on supermarkets and uh, mass industry to supply their food. And so they labeled these Victory Gardens so that people uh, would feel like they were aiding the war effort uh, with growing their own food. Very interesting. So today... Um, in, in what way is a garden a victory garden? Well, um, so as, as farmers have transitioned into commodity crops like cotton, soy, corn, corn. those kinds of things, For sure. um, the suppliers of fruits and vegetables is, has shrunken. And, um, I don't know, Loretta's talk, she, um, she has the numbers on how many, how much food was produced um, in communities versus, um, um, well, here, there's my inarticulates. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> yeah, so um, I forgot the question now. That's okay. So uh, my question was, the gardens that are out there today, how are they victory gardens? Because we're not trying to support a war effort. But we are trying to help folks with food insecurity. So in what way um, is a victory garden tied to food insecurity? Well, you know, there's a, a movement towards urban farms, right? Sure. So you're and so you're bypassing um, the kind of the corporate agribusiness and you're growing food right in your own community. Um, a lot of schools are putting gardens in because is that not the best way to learn? Kids will oh, eat right. a radish if they've grown it and they see it come out of the ground. Interesting. Whereas if you're the mom at home trying to feed your kid a radish, they're not going to eat it. And sure. I don't blame them because sure. <laughs> it's weird. And yeah. But, um, you know, being involved in that process, that is um, an educational tool that they're learning about life, biology, math, weather, science. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there's a little bit of a movement in schools towards um, having community gardens right there in the schools. Um, and then other folks that are just growing uh, gardens that don't have anything to do with schools, um, mm-hmm. are they then sharing their crops with uh, the community? And Well, that's the beautiful thing. Um, I can't remember the example that um, Loretta used in her talk, but she, it might have been... Um, Um, in Russia, you know, nobody starved because they have, I can't remember what she called them, but on the outskirts of these cities, they have these community gardens where everybody's growing food and they're, they're sharing and trading. And there's like a little micro economy there and nobody starved. They might've eaten a lot of zucchini, but they weren't hungry, you know? And so, um, and we can do that here. Um, in our own communities. And, you know? and, and, and we have, perhaps, in, in mm-hmm. our past, um, mm-hmm. uh, with the Victory Gardens, and certainly during the Great Depression, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm sure that there was a, there were a lot of folks mm-hmm. that were helping out other folks. Yeah, the history of, of, you know, what we call Victory Gardens goes back actually longer than, than World War II. They've been around for a really long time. They were just branded Victory, I think, during mm-hmm. World War as, II. As part of the war effort, mm-hmm. sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, we do have other programs. We've got, well, one thing I do want to mention, we're, all of our programs are co-sponsored by the Food Policy Council of Johnson County. So um, clear indication that we actually need a Food Policy Council. So, you know, yeah. Um, and then 
uh, K-State Research and Extension is providing making everyday choices for a healthy, sustainable diet. So um, in a place at the table, there's you see the case of people who have calorie-dense diets, but not but nutritionally deficient. So you see lots of people who, you know, were suffering from obesity, diabetes, all sorts of health-related um, health issues that are related to diet. Interesting. So food insecurity isn't just about having insufficient calories. It's about having a nutrient-dense diet, which, of course, brings up the Victory Gardens and the importance of growing food locally. Um, sure. No, so hey, so so here's a, a question. This off, do do you have your own garden? It's, it's such a long story. <laughs> I I you know I bought um, a house with an acre, and I was starting to grow food and plant things that would grow food long term. Your apple trees, your blueberry bushes, and I had a little flock of chickens. And my son has recently. Um, He's renting my house so that he can become an actual farmer. So I have moved into an apartment. I will be figuring out how to garden on a patio, which I'm, you know, it's a challenge. I'm excited about it. And also Oak Park Library, there is a community garden there. Oh, yeah. Way back when I lived in a townhouse, I had a plot there. And it was a lot of fun learning. You know, I still, it's amazing how much I have to learn. Sure. um, In terms of growing food. And last year at you know, when I had my acre, I could grow stuff, but then preserving it was a challenge. Like oh, that's a skill that we've lost over time. Yeah. So it's all. But I'm wondering, you know, with the instant pot uh, craze, I wonder if that's going to bring back a lot of canning mm-hmm. for folks. And uh, my son and I make our own yogurt. Is that I, right? I, I'll yeah. never eat store bought yogurt my again. My sister in law makes her own yogurt too. It's <laughs> fascinating. Uh, yeah. And the instant pot, it's so easy. You don't have to know anything, which right. maybe a blessing in disguise i don't know yeah. well back to the gardening so uh, i recently uh moved into a, a house and so i'm really excited about growing uh my own fruits and vegetables in my backyard but um i lived in an apartment for a number of years and i want to encourage folks to to not let that stop you mm-hmm. and it sounds like you're looking into it mm-hmm. um you know, if you've got any light at all, you yeah. can grow a garden, and yeah. they don't necessarily have to be um, in in pots. What what I did was I I got a number of buckets mm-hmm. from uh, the donut shop, mm-hmm. glazed uh, donuts, uh, the the glaze that comes in these these buckets, and uh, you fill them with dirt, put a hole in the bottom. You can put tomato plants. Mm-hmm. Uh, pepper plants, all kinds of things. It's amazing and, what you can grow on a balcony, yeah. yeah. yeah water them from the top, and yeah, uh, yeah. just yeah. whatever it takes to yeah. to make it happen. Mm-hmm. But uh, you can have your own garden, whether mm-hmm. it's hanging or traditional in the ground, raised beds, yeah. it's all good. What, what about you, Amanda? Do you do any gardening? I do not have a green thumb at <laughs> all. I can't even keep aloe vera alive, <laughs> but uh, I do have an herb garden, if that counts. That, that does <laughs> Everything count. counts. Okay. Well, so uh, is that a wrap on all the programming that we have? Uh, We'll wrap it. Well, no, it's not. Uh, We are bringing the author Leanne Brown to Uh town. I can't believe I almost forgot to mention her. Uh, She'll be here March 10th and 11th um, talking about how to eat well on four dollars a day what she wrote a cookbook as her master's thesis in food studies and um she wrote it specifically for folks on food stamps which which they get about four dollars a day it's available for a free download from her website leannebrown.com leanne with an e on the end um but she recognized that most food insecure people will not have internet and if they have that they might not have a printer so while it's available for a free download um she i think she got she maybe go fund me or got a grant or something and she had some printed oh, wow. and we've been giving copies of it away it's a gorgeous cookbook it's gorgeous i've made several recipes from it and they're quite easy and tasty um and we'll have copies of those um until we run out um, at various programs. Excellent. Yeah. And then on, on March 30th, we're having a Sharing the Harvest event um, 
we'll have uh, panel discussions with folks from After the Harvest and Harvesters um, that will be moderated by Renee Bryant from the Food Policy Council of Johnson County. And we'll have other agencies um, on hand to talk about what they're doing in our community around food insecurity. Well, so as you can hear, there's a lot going on at the library, especially with our topic and our discussions around food insecurity. If it sounds compelling at all uh, to you, then please check it out. Come to our website, jocolibrary.org slash events, and you can find all of these uh, uh, events, their times, dates, uh, a little bit more description, and we welcome you to attend. Do you have a little one? Do you know how important it is to help that little one learn to read as soon as possible? Well, here at the library, we take early literacy uh, very seriously, and we have a program called Six by Six, and it's six skills that every kid should have by six years of age. And here they are. Have fun with books. Children just want to have fun, and if we want them to learn to read, we need to make books fun and reading fun. Look for letters everywhere. Learning the letters of the alphabet is more than just singing the ABC song. Notice print all around you. Make sure your little one considers their environment and notices all the print that is around them, not only in books, but on walls, on posters, everywhere. Take time to rhyme. Children love to play, and when they play with words and the smaller sounds and words, they're developing an early literacy skill called phonological awareness. Recognizing when words rhyme and hearing the beginning sounds of words are part of this skill set. Talk, talk, talk. Use lots of language with your young children, even when they don't understand. The more words that children hear, the larger their vocabulary becomes. Tell stories about everything. Children need to understand that stories have a beginning, middle, and end before formal reading instruction begins. Understanding the sequence of events in a story will help children's comprehension. If you're interested in learning more about early literacy, 6x6, and all the wonderful things we have to offer your little one, pop over to jocolibrary.org slash 6x6. Welcome back to the Did You Hear podcast, and we are ready for our favorite segment of the show. We recommend, and we have some very special guests joining us, and our favorite kind of guests are librarians, because they like to talk about books. But before we do that, let's introduce the folks that are sitting around the table. To my left... Hi, I'm Beth Atwater. I am the fiction buyer and DVD buyer for Johnson County Library. Hi, Dave. My name is Greg Windsor. I'm a reference librarian uh, specializing in reader's advisory. And I'm Melissa Horak Hearn, and I'm a civic engagement librarian. Well, welcome to you all. And you're not just going to talk about books in general. No, no, no. It's February, so you have a very specific genre. Why don't you tell us about it, Greg? It's February, so not horror, not science fiction. <laughs> But a romance, and uh, here uh, to the uh, Did You Hear podcast, we have Beth, and Beth is, what do you do here at the library? Uh, I'm a book buyer, and spe spe specifically, sorry about that, uh, specifically I buy fiction. Uh, one of the best parts of the job is not just keeping track of what kinds of titles are most popular across the country, but what kinds of titles we can get advanced copies of and get in the system as soon as possible so people can start building holds. Okay, and how do you determine what to buy for the library? I really rely on what has established demand, which I know sounds like a buzzword, but what I mean by that is I'm looking at both uh, grassroots opportunities to look at folks talking about books, so things like Goodreads or library thing, and I'm also looking at how many copies have been printed um, and are available in publishing warehouses and how many reviews they've gotten from uh, various sources across the country to show my, to take a look and see which items have uh, significant demand for them and would be a wonderful addition to the library's collection, what we think will circulate. Well, Beth, since you handle hundreds, if not thousands of books, 
uh, per month. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you did you go through the all of those uh, those choices to figure out what you want to read? What do you, do you, Beth Atwater, want to recommend to us? Well, I'm a, a fan girl. Um, there's no better way to word that, and I'm a romance novel fan girl specifically. Um, so when I'm thinking about which items um, I personally want to read. And it's all about the HEA or the happily ever after. So I want something <laughs> that's um, going to be a relationship novel. Um, there's going to be a journey. And in the end, uh, everything is going to turn out the way it should be. The good guy gets the girl. The bad guy gets his just desserts. Um, and I, I know that it's a comfortable spot. What is it that is comfortable about books about love. What is it that you love about books about love? (laughs) What do I love about love? Um, I will admit I am a hopeless romantic. Um, I, I, in my personal life, I have been, (laughs) my husband and I have known each other since the seventh grade. Um, Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's adorably syrupy cute. Um, (laughs) (laughs) um, But what I really love about it, it, the comfort level that's there, and even when it's an adventure story and it seems like things might not go the way they should, the comfort level in knowing that the book is going to end in a happily ever after is the same kind of feeling that you get when you read a cozy mystery. You know, you you know that everything is going to be right in this little tiny world that you're you're reading in. Um, you know, there's no happier place than about page 200 of a 300 page book for me. Mm. Nice. So it's like the comfy sweatpants of uh-huh. book reading. It ex- <laughs> exactly. Romances for Beth. <laughs> What's your very favorite? Um, my all-time favorite romance novel, and there's there's deep irony in this, um, <laughs> the first romance novel I ever read, the one that got me hooked, is a book by Joan Wolfe that's called The Road to Avalon. Uh, and it is a retelling of Arthurian legend, but she's found a way to make sure that everybody in the book is a sympathetic character. And the irony comes in that it does not necessarily have a happy ending. I think we all know how Arthurian legend ends. Um, but it, it was a gateway drug into traditional romance novels. And since then, um, I read everything from historical romances to paranormal to science fiction to contemporary cozies. Um, I haven't quite gotten into the, uh, the quote-unquote bonnet rippers or the Amish romance novels, but <laughs> I'm going to get there. I promise. <laughs> I just learned about those. They're kind of fascinating. They are. They are. It's a, it's a subgenre all on its own. Now, Beth, I want to ask if I was like, if you're, if I'm a patron who doesn't read romances, mm-hmm. what's a book that you would recommend to kind of get me in as a maybe a contemporary reader? Uh, if you like contemporary romances, Jennifer Cruzy uh, is a wonderful author for you, um, specifically because she writes the quintessential rom-com. Like, you know when you get into this that you're going to chuckle a few times, you're going to laugh out loud. Um, my favorite Jennifer Cruzy novel is called Bet Me. Um, and I've it heard is, of that one. It is yes. a full-scale 90s-esque rom-com. Uh, I think there's a scene with Krispy Kreme donuts being turned into a wedding cake. That, that Nice. Just, I feel like if you've got that much imagination, then I des- your novel deserves to be read by everybody. I'm <laughs> already in. And it also has the happily ever after that Ab- they all... Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. That's a requirement. So, it, so everything... So there, the romance has to be won by the end of the book. If it's not, if someone like, if it's like a, a Nicholas Sparks novel where someone dies at the end, is that not a romance novel? It's not. It's got romantic themes, but it's not a romance novel, which is why I, the book I introduced first, the one that was my gateway drug uh, into this, <laughs> was is something that I consider kind of an ironic intro into romance because it does not have that happily ever after. It doesn't after. follow the formula, right? It doesn't follow the formula. And as we all know, genre fiction follows a formula, whether that's a mystery novel or a science fiction novel. Um, romance novels, the formula has to end in a happily ever after or a happy for now. Um, it <laughs> is all right to have a, a romance novel where folks don't necessarily get married and go off into the sunset in a full Jane Austen sense. Um, but the the two characters that are the primary um, focus of the romance do at least need to end up happily together by the end. Now, what's another author that publishes uh, is published recently that I that that you're excited about that you uh, really want people to know? I adore Alyssa Cole. I think she's um, on the tip of everybody's tongue. She right now is uh, she wrote a paranormal uh, romance series for years that was kind of science fiction based, um, and right now she's got two series that are both out at the same time and both um, in production at the same time. Uh, the first is uh, about a royal family, um, and it, the first book in that series is. Is it a princess in theory? A princess in theory. That's exactly it. Mm -hmm. And it's about a woman who keeps getting letters from an African prince. And it turns out it's not a scam. 
she really is betrothed to him. Wait, you and the one time going to Africa. Africa. So I say this is not the, the Nigerian <laughs> baker who up? wants a loan. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and then the other book series um, that Alyssa Cole writes is absolutely fascinating because that is um, it's a historical romance series that focuses on African American characters and it is set in the Civil War and post Civil War era. Um, and the the newest one in that series, which I'm so sorry, it's on the tip of my tongue, um, is uh, coming out this month the end of this month so this is the season for romance and the season for love Mm -hmm. but some of us aren't quite as demonstrative so can you tell those of us who are a little hesitant to go into the bodice buster section (laughs) why we should get over it and develop a romance with romance well first and foremost i want to establish that the only requirement for a romance novel is that it's a relationship focused novel with a happy ending so there are romances that run the gamut from Absolutely steamy and the bodice ripper that we all remember Fabio being on in the the 80s and (laughs) 90s um, to novels that are, quote unquote, bonnet rippers or novels that are gentle romance where everything that happens that might make you uncomfortable is behind the scenes. It really is a focus on two individual people, the relationship that they build together. um, And it's almost like a uh, almost like a coming of age story, except it's coming into your own in a relationship capacity. So if you're looking for something that is a little less steamy and that is a little lighter, um, I absolutely would recommend um, the the trend in Amish romance fiction. I would also recommend um, any of the Love Inspired series, which is put out by Harlequin. They're quick reads. It's not going to take long to finish them. They're usually a couple hundred pages. But in those novels, you are guaranteed that anything that might make a reader uncomfortable happens off scene and that there is a gentle read and a light focus on the, the novel. So just like there's a soulmate for everyone out there, there's a soul romance novel for everyone out there. Absolutely. Fantastic. Now, Beth, I have one final question for you. How big of the uh, reading public are romance readers? Do they get checked out? Is it kind of a small section of the library? Can you tell us about... Uh, Romance novels circ really well, um, not just in our library, but across the country. Um, We don't have necessarily it sectioned out into its own section, but we do carry romance novels in every single one of our branches. Uh, Honestly, across the country, romance is the most um, profitable, the quote-unquote finance section of publishing, because it is the most profitable and best-selling genre of fiction in in existence. So these are not uh, paperbacks that are kind of stashed in the back of the drugstore. These are up front, leading the parade, and really getting into the mainstream. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Beth. I really appreciate you dropping by the studios, and thanks for talking to us about romance. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. This is fun. Well, if anyone wants to dive into our catalog to learn all about what we're offering in romance and anything else, uh, jump to uh, our re- re- uh, sorry, our We Recommend section uh, where we have staff picks and uh, we list all the best sellers and all the award winners as well. For more episodes of Did You Hear, go to the Johnson County Library website jocolibrary.org slash did you hear.